Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with a stellar group of interviewees, Julie Enzer, Shramona Mendel, and Cheryl Clark. And we're here to celebrate the publication of this wonderful issue of Sinister Wisdom, uh, a tribute to conditions, um, a wonderful lesbian feminist publication that um, was put out in beginning in 1976. And you had 17 issues, very impressive. Uh, so the editor, these are the three editors of this volume and we're here to talk about it and celebrate it and promote it. So before we introduce our interviewees, let me turn to Julie and ask her, how viewers can get this volume and tell us a little about Sinister Wisdom, if you would. This Great. Is Thanks so much, Anne. Um, Sinister Wisdom is the longest continuously publishing lesbian literary journal. We've been publishing since 1976. Right now we do um, four issues a year, one every quarter. The issue is available to anyone who subscribes to Sinister Wisdom starting today. We'll send it out. Subscriptions are $38 for one year, $62 for two years, that's in the United States, a little bit more expensive for our comrades outside of the United States because of how much postage is these days. Folks can also order, and people can subscribe at sinisterwisdom.org slash subscribe. People can also order this individual issue at sinisterwisdom.org slash SW123. That's sinisterwisdom.org slash SW123. The issue is uh, $14, and we, then we charge um, what our actual postage cost is, which is, I believe at this moment, $3.25 um, to ship it media mail through the mail. And if people have questions, you're welcome to email me, julie at sinisterwisdom.org, and I can provide more information. All right, well, let's start with the woman who has just spoken. Julie Enzer is an editor of, the editor of, at large, I guess, of Sinister Wisdom. She's a scholar and a poet. Her scholarship is at the intersection of US history and literature with particular attention to 20th century US feminist and lesbian histories, literatures, and cultures. By examining lesbian print culture with the tools of history and literary studies, she reconsiders histories of the women's liberation movement and gay liberation. This is a fascinating field. Um, her book transcript, A Fine Bind, Lesbian Feminist Publishing from 1969 through 2009, tells stories of a dozen lesbian feminist publication, publishers to consider the meaning of the theoretical and political formations of lesbian feminism separatism and cultural feminism. You can read about her work at www.julienser.com. And you, Julie came on our show, uh, audience members may recall, 11 months ago in which she talked about this fabulous manuscript that we're all waiting for. I can't wait. You know, I watch your interview again and again, I just can't wait to read it. So, uh, Let's move to our other panelists. Sharona Mandel is an American Studies master's candidate at Brown University. And you're soon to finish that degree, is that right? Uh, you received your BA in sociology and social and cultural analysis from New York University. And we were talking yesterday and I said, I had gone to school in New York, you had too. Yep. 
<laughs> You're probably a more timely <laughs> of the whole experience. Uh, they are applying to PhDs to pursue a project investigating the cultural production of Indian American Hindu elite women. This is so fascinating, Tramona. I can't, if you have a thesis, I'd love to read it. Or For sure. Are you writing a thesis? I wrote, um, I wrote a undergrad thesis and I'm in my capstone class. So something will be coming out soon. Aha, uh -huh. that's great. When I got my MA, I chose the exam instead of the thesis. Mm -hmm. I have to procrastinate, which was my custom as an academic. Uh, right. Uh, you aim to contribute to a body of scholarship working to dismantle global Hindu nationalism. That is really important work, I think. Um, you can also find Tramona reading and writing with Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural lesbian literary and art journal of making zines and of making zines with student organizers. Welcome, Tramona. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. Uh, Cheryl Clark, who needs no introduction for many of us, is a Black lesbian feminist poet and author of six books of poetry. Um, she co-edited edited To Be Left With a Body, a literary publication of the AIDS Project Los Angeles for men of color who have sex with men, with Stephen Fullwood in 2008. Thanks to Julia R. Enzer, present company, readers may access a digitalized version of her work, narratives at the Lesbian Poetry Archive. Let me just have a little show and tell. I have a early, oh, humid pitch. I have an early, I have a firebrand edition of this wonderful volume that I have read for many years. Um, now I've lost track with my, um, in 2018, Cheryl co-edited co -edited Dump Trump Legacies of Resistance, a special issue of Sinister Wisdom with Morgan Grenwald, Stevie Jones and Red Washburn. That's a great um, title, but it's out of print now. Is that right? Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But it is available as an ebook at the Sinister Wisdom website. You can search for it. Good. Can, are you going to eventually digitalize all the Sinister Wisdom issues? Yes, eventually they'll all be digital as PDFs and available for free. Great, because I've been just reading old issues of conditions that I don't own. And it's, it's a great, you know, in fact, in our conversation, we'll put up the uh, Chiron about where you can access the old issues of conditions, uh, but we digress. Uh, since 2013, Cheryl has been one of the, been one of the co-organizers of the annual Hobart Festival of Women Writers. This is so exciting. I had no idea you were doing this. Uh, <laughs> this is in Hobart, New York, the book village of the Catskills, where her partner, Barbara Belliet, Bellier. Bellier. And she operate the Blenheim Hill New and Used Bookshop. Y'all come visit. You know, I was just in Kingston, New York over the summer. Is that near there? If I'd known, we would have come. An hour north. Really? We would have, you know, we would have made that trip. Um, I'm a compulsive book buyer. So yeah. we would, oh, and I bet you have great holdings, too. We do. All right. Welcome, everyone, again. This is very Thanks, good Anne. to have you here. Now, let's talk about the issue. You'll hear a little more from me. Uh, but then I'm hoping our panelists will talk a little. Sinister Wisdom 123 researches back 43 years to the beginnings of conditions, a feminist magazine of writing for women with an emphasis on writing for lesbians. Founded by Ellie Balkan, Jan Clausen, Irina Klepvich, and Rima Shore, in 1977. And let me just throw in my own uh, autobiography. I moved to Boston in 1979 
and belong to the collect collective of the second wave, uh, which was also a feminist magazine, but five of the six collective members were lesbian. And so it was my ticket into this wonderful explosion of lesbian print culture. And these women figured prominently, and so did you, Cheryl. I was saying earlier to uh, your co-panelists that every poetry reading I went to, you were there reading, and it, it, you're such an important part of that history show. So thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. I keep digressing. Uh, this issue honors one of the signal publication of the late women in print movement, a time of prodigious writing, organizing, and creating when women seized the time and the means for our own revolution in letters. Um, let me just take a moment to quibble because I think the women in print movement is still alive. It's being dig digitalized and maybe it's just nostalgia. But uh, according to this- I uh, agree with you. Yeah, I agree you with you. Yeah, I mean, my heart sort of skipped a beat when I saw the late women in print movement. Um, okay. Paying tribute to conditions as one of the new number of US lesbian pub feminist publications, which asserted for 13 years, recognizes the words of Jamie Harker and Cecilia Contrafar that books could be revolutionary, that language could remake the world and that writing mattered in a profound way. I think it still matters in a profound way. I'm a true believer. But I have some questions for our panelists. The first is, how did this issue come together? I'll start with that. How did you happen to do it? I mean, there's a little conversation in the beginning of the issue about Cheryl and Julie discovering all the boxes in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. How long ago? Oh, this was this was more than 10 years ago. Julie came to my well, she tells the story, but she drove to my house in Jersey City. She drove from Washington or Maryland. Well, anyway, same difference. And <laughs> um, she was insistent upon taking conditions under her wing, and she did. I had had it in storage, I don't know how long, a long time, a long time since a long time, 1992 probably. And you were paying for storage all those years. Yes, I was. That's but it wasn't that much. Um, and so we we packed them up and she took them and uh, she sent them at her own expense to libraries all over the country. So she had a commitment to conditions for so long. And uh, it was her idea to do a tribute issue. And how you were involved because you were an editor and you were the custodian of the actual volume. Yes, but also I was on the board of Sinister Wisdom. So so she could just reach out and command that I help her. <laughs> Shramona, how did you get involved? I found out about um, Sinister Wisdom when they were advertising the Asian lesbians issue. Mm -hmm. And at the Asian American Lit, Lit Fest in 2019, and I missed the deadline for submissions. So I decided I'd just email Julie and ask to get involved as an intern. And in 2020, January, I joined as an intern and Julie had this project with the Conditions Archive in her head. 
And we talked about it. And after digitizing one copy of A Sinister Wisdom, I said, I want to do this. I want to dig into the archives with you all. So I was able to join I, and start this amazing project. That's great. Um, so how long is, has it been in process? Many years from when you unpacked all the volumes. Um, but when you just, when you focused, when Julie, I guess, decided to have an issue, how, what was the time frame between that decision and the publication, which is recent? So I just want to add one other piece sure. of the genesis because um, I completely cribbed the structure for what, what eventually became the issue that we have now from E.G. Crichton, who was the art director of the journal Outlook, which published mm -hmm. from 1989 until 1993. And mm -hmm. E.G. did a, a, a similar sort of archival project paying tribute to Outlook um, in San Francisco and did a museum exhibition and another issue of Outlook. And she recruited um, younger people who hadn't necessarily even been born when Outlook was published to respond to each of the issues of Outlook that were, that were published. And I learned about this at the Queer History Conference in June of 2017. Um, so that like, and, and I remember sitting in the conference and listening to the panel and saying like, this is what we should do for conditions. It was so clear to me um, that this was like the structure, it was like the, the queer revelation. And so then I like knew the structure, I came to Cheryl, Shramona appeared to us and it was like um, Oceans, Oceans eight or nine, whatever the one <laughs> the women, like the whole band was together and now we could go do it. But, you know, like most issues take a good two or three years from an idea to actually having the physical book. Well, this has been about five. Very yes. impressive. So let's talk about the structure. You were able to elicit contributions from all the original contributors. That's an accomplishment in itself. Did you have trouble finding people or? All the original editors. Editor, exactly, sorry. Good correction. Yes, all the original editors. How did you find them? Cheryl? <laughs> well, uh, they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> we. <laughs> But we you know where they many, were. We found many of the editors. We didn't find them all. Some of them didn't want to write. But the ones we found did, obviously. Uh -huh. So we we got something from the four founding editors. Each of the four founding editors. Uh, Julie and Shramona did did an interview with Irena Klepfitz, Ellie Balkan submitted some archival material, and uh, Rima Shore and Jan Clausen wrote essays. I love so those essays. We had their presence uh, in uh, our tribute. You didn't that, want to not have them in there. <laughs> well, I know it was so important. Um, and just in, as an aside, when I was looking up Shramona for the show, I Googled her and stumbled upon your interview with Arena Klepfich, which I immediately mm -hmm. watched. It was it's a fabulous interview. And you know, the condensation in the issue is good, but I encourage viewers to look up Shramona and you'll find it on Google. I mean, I loved her, uh, what you condensed of her piece because it's so optimistic about um, making change and that you don't need a hundred people. That used to, as mm -hmm. started with the three of you and you've produced this great publication. Um, but, you know, you could have two, another pioneer 
um, says you can, that I know, he says you can have two or three people on a street corner and that'll begin a movement. You know, so I love the optimism in that uh, interview. Uh, so we talked about, well, not only did you have contributors to each of the issue, you had respondents. You had 17 respondents, uh, including Cheryl and Shromo. No, Cheryl wrote an obituary, right? And yeah, Shromo yes, yes. About. Yeah, I want to ask about that inclusion too. But how did you, how did you get these contributors, these respondents, and what made you, what was your principle of selection? That was Julie, Cheryl and I putting our brains together, <laughs> uh, pulling from the lesbians we knew. Yeah, you know? And um, yeah, it was, it was actually fun reaching out to different people. Julie knows everyone. <laughs> so yeah, that she was does. Very... <laughs> she, she knows a, a lot of people. <laughs> that was good. That's great. I mean, you really have a, a range, you know, people who are kind of famous like Sarah Schulman and Carmen Maria Machado and people who are really good that may not have as high a profile. So it was, uh -huh. it was, um, let me ask you about the conclusion then you, so you have contributors, um, respondents, and then you include an obituary, a tribute a couple of tributes. How did you, and a book review. How did you happen to do that? How did you happen to include that in the, in the issue? Well, Carol Oliver, to whom we have uh, the tribute obituary, was a member of the Conditions Collective. And she died quite young in 1995. So, uh, we wanted to say something about her. And uh, she and Gloria Hall were close friends. And I asked Gloria if she would, you know, if she would write a remembrance of Carol. At first she said no, because she thought it would be too emotional. And then she said, yes. So she wrote it. And Julie asked me if I'd write the obituary for Carol. And of course I said, yes. So that's, that's why that obituary is, is, is in the tribute issue. One of the things that I want to just add that I because when when we were when we were researching everybody who worked um, editorially on the original 17 issues of conditions, um, we discovered I think Cheryl knew it, but I think Shramona and I discovered that she that Carol had died in in 1995 and um, and one of the things I feel really passionately about in Sinister Wisdom, like is the obituary work that we do that we include tributes and remembrances that really contextualize lesbian life in rich ways. And so knowing that she had died and all knowing that she had died and was part of the original, part, was, was a member of the collective and also that there was scant information available out about her life. Right, and realizing how easy it is for people's lives to, to be forgotten and for their contributions not to be recognized. And that without sort of rich stories of who lesbians were and what kind of work they did, we have an even harder time for people to imagine what sorts of work they might do in their own lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's the tribute to Kay Tobin Lahausen. Yeah, well, Kay died. Uh, so then the other piece, the other thing that's uh, that we uh, that I always try to save some room for um, in Sinister Wisdom is that we have space for for tributes for people who died. Kay was one of the um, original members of the Daughters of Belitis, and Marcia um, Marcia Gallo wrote about it, and she, and she of course has written um, different daughters. The the really um, 
uh, definitive, one of the definitive histories of the daughters of Belitis. So when she emailed me and said, I'd like to do something, I said, yes, of course. And it worked into this particular issue. And then we also include book reviews um, in issues. Sometimes editors tie the book reviews thematically to what's happening in the issue. And sometimes um, I just drop them in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about the book review policy? I think I might have, um, I might have read somewhere that, and I try to do this with the show. Um, I try to showcase less LGBTQ voices and not tear them down. You know what I mean? I, I try to celebrate them more than uh, criticize. And what about you? Don't do you run negative reviews, or do you have a review policy? Um, we we don't have a policy. I try. I mean. You know, Anne, you write reviews and all of us have written reviews. You know, it's an extraordinary amount of work. Um, I always ask, you know, everybody contributes their work to Sinister Wisdom for free. Um, so we, we tend to not have hard and fast policies because a lot gets done on, on goodwill and good feeling. Um, I, I do, when I receive books that I want to be reviewed, I, I ask people up front, you know, like, is this an area of interest? I want to write, I want to run reviews by people who are sympathetic to what the author is trying to do and really tries to understand what their work is and convey it to our readership in a way that people can um, imagine whether or not they want to read the book for themselves. So, so that's the kind of approach that I take to our, to our book reviews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so it's taken five years. Um, and you, how did you find the contributors? Just word of mouth or? The responded. Julie knew many of them. She uh -huh. knew many of the many of the uh, intergenerational contributors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she reached out to many of them. Mm -hmm. And the way that it worked for us was we sat down with the seventeen issues and we thought of who would have a really wonderful response to the particular issue that we wanted to. Um, get reflections and speculations and etc on so Julie and I were sitting we had that spread and we were thinking about who would match well with each issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's great well the product is certainly exemplary um, let's talk a little about some of the contributions um, Sarah Schulman who I'm a huge fan of Sarah's um, she responded to uh, one of the issues, and I'd like to read a, a little of her response, if I could. Uh, and ask you to comment. Uh, it concerns lesbian culture and marginalization. And she says, the price of keeping your own culture alive and evolving was separation. In many ways, feminist and lesbian artists repeated this conundrum. And 40 years later, the marginalization continues. So the first question I'd like to ask you, um, let me digress. I took a lesbian culture class in, uh, at University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1986. And mm. the teacher whom I admired uh, was rumored at the end of the class to question the existence of les of lesbian culture. And she was a big postmodernist and, you know, but I disagreed and I still disagree, but what are your thoughts about lesbian culture? Does it exist and what are its features, would you say? And of course there are millions of different lesbian cultures, but um, maybe lesbian print, digital reading culture. Well, yes, a lesbian culture still exists, and I think it will exist. Um, and lesbian print culture still exists. Yes. I think that one of the issues is um, 
that, <coughs> excuse me, some of our work has been absorbed into mainstream culture. So sometimes we forget its origins, especially many of those who are absorbed into the mainstream. <laughs> so yes, it's it, it still exists and people like Julie continue its vibrancy. We also know uh, um, this new book that just came out, Mouths of Rain. Have you heard of it, Anne? I have. Mouths of... Do you have it? No, I'll get it. Where is it? Who published Mouth it? Mouths of Rain, uh, the new press, Julie's Press published it. But it's about, it, it's Black lesbian culture. That's what she writes about. And um, the, the editor Jones. So she has very well chosen Black lesbian literary contributions past and present. Um, so yes, it still exists and there are people who are keeping it alive. Even though the language we use to describe lesbians is evolving. Well, that reminds me of the interview that you did with Irina Klepfitz, where she talked about those early days. And she said, I'm paraphrasing, we rejected mainstream culture, but we all want, kind of wanted to be respectable too. Remember that? Yeah. I remember that. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, we were all kind of vehement in uh, rejecting mainstream culture. And Schulman goes on, to, to address that when she says, the, hence the long overdue retrospective view on the historic and foundational conditions magazine takes place in sinister wisdom because of the marginalization. Under the guidance of the gifted visionary editor, present company, Julie Enzer, instead of in the New Yorker or in the New York Review of Books. So we are still marginalized. Um, is that a problem, do we think, or does it even matter? Um, you know, I sort of resist uh, the marginalization argument. Uh, I resist it because we do not view our publications as marginal. Now, maybe the New Yorker and the New York Times are marginal to us. Good point. <laughs> but, and also, there is a reason we are, we still reject the mainstream because the mainstream, um, is not always where we want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, we still have our audiences, you know, that we have, that we are responsible to. So, I mean, that's, right. I'll stop right there. Shramona, where do you weigh in on this, these questions? Um, I kept thinking about, um, lesbian culture and the and exactly what Cheryl said, New York Times being marginal to us. And I was thinking about this very. It's been uh, it's been turned into a controversial topic, but this idea of safe space and it's okay. less safe space and more autonomous space in my head. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I like that, that. Yes. So I think that uh, 
that's what it is more so than marginalization. And I think about how it's in 2018 that on Tumblr, um, where I get most of my lesbian culture uh, when I was younger. And um, it was in 2018 that Emily Gwen designed the lesbian flag. And there's so many different iterations of it that come out. There's Twitter bots that are lesbian pot of positivity Twitter bots. And I think that lesbian culture is so alive and we are always trying to look back to what the work, the work that had already been done. Even if it is marginal, it is autonomous. And that connection is still very much alive. Mm -hmm. And it has many manifestations, as you suggest. Absolutely. Any thoughts, Julie? Come on, Julie. I think that the only thing, you know, the only thing um, I'll add is I think I think it's a real it, I think it's a complex question of this this sort of relationship between um, a, a broader either popular culture or intellectual culture and different and lesbian cultures and questions of marginalization. And you know I'll note that Sarah Schulman was the person who wrote about it. Sarah has occupied many spaces in all of this throughout her career. Like let's not forget that Sarah's first novel was published by Barbara Greer of Naiad Books. So mm -hmm. she profoundly comes out of lesbian print culture. Um, and, and I think her, this, the sort of valences of her questions really are about um, power and how um, writers and artists gain power, which is also um, the ability to pursue their work with more autonomy. Um, so I think, so those are some of the kind of questions that she asks. For me, some of the questions, although I'm, you know, deeply gratified by the kind words that she says, I'm also profoundly aware that I have chosen every step of the way to um, edit Sinister Wisdom, to give, to give Sinister Wisdom my time because of the um, because of the flexibility and because of the belief that I have in the value of this work, even if it's not in the New Yorker or the New York Review of Books, to me, like there, it's just different questions about different choices that writers and activists make about the work that they do with their one life. That's very Another, good, Julie. Yeah, yeah. Well, all of your answers were really superlative. Uh, I also liked the essay about the university. And um, I have to say, I identified with a lot of this in this volume, but um, Rachel Corbin, I can't read my writing, responding to conditions one, talked about many of us having, not to use the word marginal, but um, tentative, almost insecure relationships to the academy but how we brought that, uh, the knowledge that we have as lesbians, as les participants or devotees of lesbian culture um, to the academy in our, you know, like for example, I taught for 30 years, I never had a tenure track job, but I was able to teach lesbian lit and I was able to teach, you know, once I got control of the syllabus, I could go to town. I mean, that was a huge privilege at the time. Uh, and it was in Louisiana, so I don't know if I'd be able to do that today, but that's another, I mean, the whole collection is really wide ranging. Um, so let me ask Cheryl, if I, if you don't mind, uh, do you think, I really enjoyed the Pentalogue, which I was able to access online. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there's a black lesbian canon? You were talking in the, uh, you were all talking about the canon form formation, and mm -hmm. I was struck by how different things are. Yes, I think there is, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait to read this book you just recommended. <laughs> I'm in that book, too. <laughs> oh, great, great. Um, yes, I think so. I think... Uh, I think thanks to people like Barbara Smith and conditions and sinister wisdom, 
all have led to the creation of a black lesbian canon. And uh, the editor of Mouths of Rain, Brianna S. Jones, she's committed to she's committed to furthering that canon of black lesbian literature. So yes. It's fabulous. Um, speaking of your wide ranging writings, you've written a lot of essays for publication. And my question is, do you, do you plan to publish a collection of essays that we'd all love to read? Um, no plans are in the works as yet. Uh, some of my, a number of my essays are in the days of good looks, <laughs> prose and poetry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Prose and poetry, 1980 to 2005. It is now out of print, but a number of them have been there. Uh, <sighs> essays are so much work. But you've written a lot of them. Yes, but there's still so much work. Um, maybe, Anne, but none are in the works as of okay. yet. <laughs> okay. Because maybe, was... Cheryl, you will talk a little bit about the book that is in the works. Oh. Please. Uh, Yes, and I have, <laughs> thanks, Julie, I have um, a book of new and collected poetry that's due to be out from Northwestern University next year, 2023. So that's what I'm working on now. That's great. And you'll have to come on the show when it comes out and share some with the viewers. Certainly, Ann, just write me. Oh, okay. Um, let me ask a couple of more questions before we close. Um, Shramona, uh, you were able to write a response to conditions 10, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was epistolary, um, which I liked a lot. Thank uh, you. And there's some, I mean, there's poetry and there are essays and, you know, there's the epistolary introduction with Ellie Balkan. But um, let me read your, and ask you to respond to the following comment that you made in this letter. I began to learn the ways that intentional, ambitious, and small scale circulations, it's getting dark here, <laughs> sorry, uh, circulations can do the heavy lifting of building power. Do you want me to read it again since I stumbled through it? I began to learn the ways that intentional, ambitious and small scale cir circulations can do the heavy lifting of building power. Absolutely. So can you expand on that, please? Sure. Um, I think doing, doing this issue and the interview that Julie and I did with Irena Clefish was very pivotal in, me, in helping me understand power and organizing because um, I've come to understand organizing as coming to collectively understand not only our role in social change, but our capacity to build change. And um, that realization, it only happens in practice and writing and reading and doing editorial work and and what I was seeing in Conditions 10, doing the fundraising, doing the more logistical work, deciding how to review and what to include 
and how to have that conversation with everyone. But in this very um, decentralized, this very sparse and uh, distributed network, like that, that to me was very powerful, but also it was inspiring to think about how that is so much more possible even now. And just this idea that power is built through realizing visions collectively, through really um, understanding how coming together makes things possible and, and committing to small scale instead of do, over committing yourself, all of that stuff is very much um, a lesson of conditions. And also just the fact that it's lesbian publication um, or actually a lesbian editorial board running a feminist publication that was doing this. So that was that was incredible for me to learn about. So the power of collabor women's collaboration and community lives on. Absolutely. Well, that's encouraging, along with the women in print culture that we think is, is also continuing. Uh, Julie, let me ask you, uh, let me read a quotation of yours back to you, if, if you wouldn't, if that's okay. And then I would ask you to respond to it. Now I've turned the light on, so that might be more. Uh, propitious for me. Uh, sinister wisdom understands the vital importance of promulgating the lesbian literary good news and that conditions of a feminist magazine of writing with an emphasis on writing by lesbians was one of our most marvelous radical beacons. And the lesbian literary good news continues. Julie, what, tell us about the lesbian literary good news. And you're welcome to chime in other panelists. We could all use some lesbian literary good news, I think. Well, I think that, you know, one of the really marvelous things about where we are right now is that there's a variety of places where lesbian writing is reaching um, interested and receptive audiences. So it's ha it is happening in, what um, Park Bowman and June Arnold called the mainstream publishing houses. That was their kind of take on mainstream. Um, the, the large commercial publishing houses are publishing really interesting, edgy, important work by lesbian writers. Um, and I think, I think that we have to recognize that and, um, um, and appreciate that for the, the kinds of distribution that those authors get and the audiences that they're able to reach. Well, at the same time, we have really interesting things happening in, um, in lesbian periodicals like Sinister Wisdom. Um, there's another periodical called WMN Zine. Um, there's a periodical that's called Lesbians Are Miracles that publishes exclusively online that Is has- Is it a or magic? But lesbians are mad. I always confuse the two, right? And I just happen to know that because I've listened to your last interview eleven months ago. Right. I always, I always confuse. I'm, I'm just pulling up to see if I can, can see it, but I don't right away. Lesbians are either miracles or they're magic. Or both. Um, some of us think that they're both, but only one is the <laughs> title of the journal, and I think, and it's one of the most beautifully produced. Um, lesbian journals that that I've seen um, perhaps ever they they're just doing fabulous stuff kind of uniting text and visual artwork um, and so so and and then on top of that there are uh, various publishing efforts that are happening um, Jewel Gomez has a new collection of writing coming out of poems coming out from BLF Press um, that S. Andrea Allen runs. Um, the Lisa Moore from Redbone Press has done some of the most innovative publishing over the past 20 years. Um, so there's lots of really interesting pockets of things happening um, and um, things coalescing in different ways that I think is really exciting and that I think nurtures writers and readers and help, help us all in times that can be really um, precarious economically and depressing politically, um, this work is coming out to help us have a vision and have some sort of support for imagining new and different kind of futures. 
Well said. Any other lesbian good news anybody wants to share? Thank you. Or should we move on to last words? Uh, we're getting to the end of the show, unfortunately, but there's plenty of time for valedictory remarks from each of you. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like the audience to know? And what are your concluding thoughts? Well, I'd like to thank you, Anne, for interviewing us and for having your show. Well, thank you for coming on. I'm very grateful. You know, I'm you're three luminaries. You'll <laughs> elevate the discourse of our of our Le lesbianaries. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you. Is there are there any last thoughts that you have for us? I'll say order the issue, uh, subscribe to Sinister Wisdom. Sinisterwisdom.org is the URL where you can do everything. Um, and, and always, if you're sitting out in the audience thinking, well, why did they do conditions and not this magazine, which is my favorite, and you wanna be a part of another editorial collective, please reach out. There's always more work to do. And we, and Sinister Wisdom, I think of us as the organization that says yes to lesbians and lesbian ideas. So if you <laughs> have them, Love it. reach out and, let, and let's work together. Okay, Shramona, you're on the spot. Last oh word. no, I yeah. would just say that intergeneration, intergenerational space is everything. And I'm really grateful to your show and to Sinister Wisdom for creating something like this. And yeah, that, that's my concluding thought. <laughs> Thank you. Cheryl, anything else? No, I think I said enough. <laughs> <laughs> Never enough. We'll, all, we'll look for your current Yay. publications and for your work everywhere uh, that you. I've been uh, enjoying and thank you all very much for joining us we had a great time and uh, keep up the good work all of you lesbian print culture lives yeah thank you for joining us and until next time remember resist